Today's recipe is a layer cake, chocolate. And we're gonna have a little bit of fun making it. Today I'm gonna be getting in the kitchen and making a big, beautiful chocolate layer cake. Yeah, gorgeous. Before I do that though, there is something I wanna show you and something I wanna mention. In the description boxes for my videos, I've started putting links uh, to my website. Not all of my videos have them yet, but many of them do. A whole lot more coming soon will have them. I have, um, I have one of those printed out right here. I print out all of mine, and that way I can kind of proof them and make sure they look right on paper. And I'm using uh, just a simple glossy brochure paper, the cheap stuff, you know, you get in an office supply. And printed it out like this, and uh, so I get an excellent recipe. And this is just an open page to one of them. Some of them are two pages, some of them are four, uh, and some three, you know, and they're laid out with smart instructions that are numbered smart thinking and uh, some place in the back at the end for you to write to put some notes in for you to write in your own notes for changes and things that you want to do so really cool recipes and worth your time to look at uh, they're 25 cents at the moment and uh, don't know what that'll change to in the future but who knows and I might be doing some compilations like um, some uh, PDF books anyway Let's talk about this. This is chocolate cake. We're gonna be getting in the kitchen in a second and cooking this up. Now this is a basic two layer chocolate cake and I wanted to do a very basic, just two layers to show you basic cake making. Now later on, we're gonna get into some big cakes. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So you see this big, this big honking four layer cake here that's got all of this, this, this basket weave on the outside and everything. Uh, and I was using a really tiny basket weave tip, trying to do like a micro basket weave, and it was quite complex, and um, there's, there's a lot to doing a cake like that. And it takes a lot of patience. And so the thing of it is, is I'm going to get into that kind of stuff a little later on in this series. And that was just me practicing up, because I was way out of practice. I'm decades out of practice on this. So I had to practice up a little bit. Today you're gonna see a simple two layer cake. You're gonna get a chance to make this. The fillings, you're gonna learn that you can make this stuff whatever flavor you want. You can make it rum, coffee, chocolate, orange, lemon, peppermint if you would like. If you want it, you can make it hazelnut or almond. There's so many flavors you can make that buttercream in between and on the outside. We'll get into all of that. This is gonna be a whole new series for season six. Texas cooking today goes baking. Come on, let's get in the kitchen. Let's cook this up and have us some delicious cake. Come on. Now folks, to build a chocolate layer cake, we have to make two nine inch cakes. And that's what I am giving you the recipe for here. And this will give you a cake that's just a, a little over an inch high. It's about an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half tall, depending on uh, where you live and how yours comes out. All right, so what we have here, wonderful ingredients. I've got butter, flour, sugar, some vanilla, milk, and eggs. Also some cocoa, cinnamon, salt, baking soda, and baking powder. And this, of course, this back here is just basic ingredients for a cake. It's how we flavor it. This is a chocolate cake, so we're using plenty of cocoa here. We use the cinnamon, just a tiny bit of it, it kind of hides in the background, but it turns, it, it, what it does with cocoa is, is hard to describe, but it's like a perfect marriage of flavors. It's kind of like when somebody came up with the uh, peanut butter cup with chocolate and peanut butter in the middle. That is so good. And it, this is similar in that the two flavors work well. The vanilla, you don't notice it at all, but it makes a chocolate cake seem more chocolatey. It has that effect on the flavor of a chocolate cake and on your palate. So that's how and why and what for. So let's move on to getting this done. We're gonna have to start by creaming the butter and getting some sugar worked into it and we'll make this cake. 
we have a series of steps to do in order to make this cake. We need to A, get our pans out, grease and flour those pans, and that covers it you know, with grease and plenty of flour. If you have a spray-on coating, that works well also. Use that. We have some wonderful stuff sitting out here, and we're going to have to treat it the right way. I've got to cream the butter, but then I have to cream in that sugar. I need to take my flour and get these dry ingredients sifted into it. I need to crack my eggs and have them ready to go. Milk is ready to go, and so is the extract. So from here, it's just a matter of a few little prep items, and we get busy cooking. I've already cracked my eggs. Now I'm going to sift off these ingredients. I'm going to take my flour and just put him right down here in my sifter. On top of that, I'm going to go in with all of my other, whoops, with <laughs> all of my other ingredients. Let's have a little fun in the kitchen, folks. Now, let's go in here. Now the reason I'll do that is because these things, they'll stick to the cups. And normally, <laughs> normally when I'm cooking, I just measure everything into the sifter, okay? Uh, but you know, when you're doing cooking on video, it's a little different. And with the magic of video, everything is suddenly clean. Isn't it amazing how that works? So Now the idea here is you want to sift your flour. You want to sift your cocoa and the other ingredients. And number one, we're combining ingredients, but more important, we're making sure there are no lumps. And in the top of my sifter here, sure is enough. They're not big ones, but there's some little lumps up in there. Ladies and gentlemen, you see what's going on in there? That is what I'm talking about. We sift for a couple of reasons. We sift to aerate the uh, ingredients. We sift to mix the ingredients. Uh, and we sift to create a better cake, but also to make sure that we don't have lumps of anything we don't want lumps of. Okay, we got it all laid out. Our eggs are cracked. Everything is sifted back here. The butter is brought up to room temperature and ready to go. Now what I need to do, get my paddle on there. Now there's different implements that you have for these, okay? You have one that's a whisk, you have this paddle, you have another that's a dough hook. For doing cakes and cake batters, the paddle works usually the best. All right, now you may have one of those double beater type mixers. The regular double beaters work great for this. It's a perfect type of mixer to use for this. I used those things for years and I love them. They work great. So let's get after this. Now you see how that butter is kind of already soft and it's just moving around. But look at the quantity. Look how much there is in there. There's not a whole lot. In a minute it's going to look like there's a lot more. There we go. Now I'm going to give this a few minutes to run, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a timer to count up. I'm going to start this right now. One, two, three, four. I'm going to just set this right down here, and we'll use that as an indicator of what's really going on and how long things take. It may be a little different for you, depending on your mixer your altitude, the humidity outside, barometric pressure, uh, a lot of things vary on baking, okay? So be ready for that. If you're new to mixing, if you've never had one of these, never put your fingers in there, never put one of these in there if the thing is running, and never add ingredients when it's going at high speed. I'm gonna turn that off. We are now at five minutes and a few seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna tap that and it'll pause it right there. I wanted to show this to you. It doesn't look like much has happened, but look at the color. See how it's lighter? Now, if nothing was happening, that color would not be lighter. It would just be the same. It's lighter because we have whipped some air into it, and so the color that was in that butter isn't going quite as far. Now, I'm going to take this and I just break it free from the sides of the bowl like so. Okay. Get that bowl back up in there. wipe this off. Now something else that helps is to have some sort of a, a pitcher, bowl, or container to put your spatula down into. Whenever you're baking, having something like that handy is going to be so much nicer for you. It's a lot cleaner and easier. Now I'm going to turn this back on, turn the timer back on, and we're going to do a little more creaming. Don't worry if it doesn't look like nothing's happening. It is. 
This is a game of patience. You have to be patient and you have to go through the steps to get the right results. There we go. Okay, I have a little vegetable shortening right here. This is called greasing and flouring our pans. And what we want to do is to take and rub an even coating of vegetable shortening or lard or butter all over the pans. Now the idea here, ladies and gentlemen, is to provide a non-stick coating. Now you can say, hey, I went out and bought non-stick pans, so I don't need to do that. Well, yes you do. Even if you have non-stick pans, that'll reduce the occurrence of sticking. But when it comes to baking, it's only so effective, okay? And I have learned over the years, even the best of non-stick coatings will only work so well, all right? So a lot of times they will fail you. You'll end up with an upsetting ending to your cake. This little procedure is easy. Now what's even easier than this, <laughs> they make a spray-on coating that's already got the flour in it, okay? So you can just do a spray-on coating that replaces what I'm doing here. And to do a grease and flour, it works like this. Boom. We put a little flour into our greased pans and shake that flour all throughout. We want it to hit all of the surfaces, including the sides. And when you're finished, go ahead and pour out the flour, but there may be some stuck, so simply tap it out. That is a greased and floured pan, and a cake will not stick. Well, let's turn him off again. This is 926, so we've been almost 10 minutes worth of work here, okay? So let's take a look at this. And you know what, like I said, it can be a little different from you. It could, the butter may cream up faster for you, and it may have to do with a lot of other factors. But look at this, look. We now suddenly have considerably more butter. Whoops making a mess. Considerably more butter than when I started. Some of it's now on the outside of the bowl. Alrighty. I'm going to take this now that I have just about doubled it in its quantity. See how I'm running a slow speed? Now let's, while we're running a slow speed, gently add in a little of our sugar at a time. Don't be in a rush about this. Again, baking is about patience and going through the steps the right way. We took the time to cream our butter until it got to the right con consistency. By the way, my timer's still running. A little more. I'm adding in, oh, I would guess somewhere around a, a quarter to a third of a cup at a time. Okay, all of our sugar is in. Now that the sugar is in, I have to cream it all over again. So, I'm going to turn this thing back up and let it have at it. Okay, we'll let that run for a bit and take a look at it in just a few minutes. Okay, occasionally you've got to stop these things when you're doing mixing and things like that and knock off what's on the edges of the bowl. Now that might sound weird. You got a mixer. Why do you need to reach in and mix things? Well, because the, while the mixer does a beautiful job of mixing, it can't get to quite everything. And if you will notice, let's look from this camera down. Let's zoom in. You see these white streaks here? That's just plain butter that didn't get hit. That was against the edge of the bowl there. All right. So we don't want any of that going on. And there's a little bit of it. So we do this and this this stops that problem altogether. We are now 1554, and we're gonna keep running this until we get a nice, smooth, creamy consistency. Let's take a look at what we got. We are at 1947. At the moment, I can already see a difference. All right, right there. This is starting to look a little bit better. I'm gonna feel it. It's still gritty, okay, which is expected. But, here's the thing, I have 
a great deal more because of this. I'm going to run it just for a couple more minutes and then I'm going to work in those eggs and we are ready to go. So about two more minutes of beating. All right, that was it right there. Now, sometimes if you'll know, see how my beater is up towards the front of the machine. If you stop and your beater's like that, bump it just a little bit, just like that. See, you can work it around to wherever you want it. I like it towards the back and it gives me a little more room to work and get things done, okay? So here's what I have, is I have this beautiful creamed butter and sugar mixture that is ready to be turned into a cake. So we got a, a nice, smooth, creamy consistency here. Um, and if I wanted, I could go ahead and just simply cream that butter until the whole thing is smooth. But on this particular cake, it's really not that necessary. We're using leavening on this cake, and so we're not trying to build our fluff with the egg and the butter. Although we get a lot from that, but we get as much from the leavening that we've put into it. So next thing is eggs, all right? Oh, by the way, our count, we've passed 20 minutes. We're up to 358 on the recount. Next, I wanna work in the eggs one at a time, emulsifying them completely. At first, it will look like the egg doesn't want to mix in, like it's just going to kind of uh, make a mess in the middle. But in a few minutes after it mixes, you'll notice how it emulsifies, and we will watch that happen right here. All right now. One egg. Now, you can tell when it's working, when it pulls the cake mixture off of the side of the bowl and emulsifies in and kind of fluffs up a little bit. Look at the difference one egg gets us. See how it puffs up instantly? And that's what the egg does. It gives us that, that, that fluffiness to a cake. There we go, egg number two. They're not in there for flavor, ladies and gentlemen. They're in there for effect. Long ago, before you had baking soda and baking powder, you had only the egg doing the job of rising that cake. And it was very important. At that time, you used to see a lot more eggs used in cakes. Uh, and it would be for the effect of better rise. Let's we'll see what happens when we fluff it. Now make sure when you're watching this, watch up close. Look at the sides of the bowl, the shapes that it makes as it's working because that's what makes the difference in this game. Now you can already see a serious difference in the volume inside of our bowl. So we started with a little bit of butter in the bottom and just grew it and then added sugar and then grew that and then added the eggs and now it's really fluffing up. And you can see just from this process here, the difference the egg has on a cake. Don't forget, occasionally stop it and scrape it down. There we go. Now we finished that creaming. Look at the volume that we have now. There's a lot going on in this bowl and all we have is a stick and a half of butter, a cup and a half of sugar, and a couple of eggs. And folks, that's a lot more volume than just that. Look at that, that's a lot going on right there, okay? So, now that we have built that beautiful beginning, this is sort of like the basis of what goes on to make good cake. Let me get my, I like to use a measuring cup for this step. And all I'm trying to do is just get flour into my cake. And I wanna make as little mess as possible. Low speed. Always do ingredient additions at low speed, if especially if they're powdery. You saw how that cocoa powder flew around earlier. You see how little of it gets kicked up right there? And we're running on slow speed. So we add a little bit of that mixture, match it with a little bit of milk, and we simply go back and forth this way, working both of them until they're all worked in. So you don't throw everything in just all at once. This is a slow add it to it game. As you can see, we have a beautiful mixture coming along. Now this is Mexican vanilla and they don't process theirs the way other folks do. Give it a little bit of a shake at first 
It's a very smart thing to do. I like the Mexican vanilla. I think it tastes better than almost any other kind. One teaspoon is more than enough for this job. Okay, folks, we are at four minutes, 16 seconds. And this, let me bump that towards the back. There we go. Look how smooth that is. That beautiful, beautiful, smooth cake batter. The two pans that were greased and floured. The oven has been preheating to 350 degrees. So at this point, kind of breathe deep. Everything's going good. Let's take our batter and get my mixer out of the way here. Alrighty. This, we want to kind of divide up as much as we can into two parts. So that is sort of my focus here. Wow, that is a beautiful smooth batter. So the thing of it is here, you're just kind of doing guesswork. You're kind of guessing how much goes in each pan. And if you want, just go back and forth a little bit until it looks like you got about the right amount in each one. And they don't have to be absolutely perfect, okay? Don't lose sleep if one of them is slightly larger than the other. Guess what? Big deal. <laughs> it won't affect the total amount of cake that's in your cake, all right? So don't lose sleep over that. The smell of this batter is already just incredible. The thing of it is, is, I've had this cake before. It is a really, it's a genuinely really good cake. All right, now here's the thing. If we're going to make a layer cake, our layers need to be fairly even. You see this circular motion I'm making from the center to the near the outer edge, about a half inch away. And I'm just working in a circle. And all I'm trying to do is just to get it kind of level kind of level, not level level. Okay, so there we go. That one's kind of level. We're going to level it in a minute though. This is just getting it spread out because see on some of these, it's not all the way to the edge there, you see. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to set my spatula right on the edge of the pan and over to the far edge. And I want to lock it, my arm against my waist, and I'm going to angle this just slightly and I'm going to rotate my pan. And the idea here is to keep the spatula as level as absolutely possible. Now you see right there we have a low spot. Now I know where some of this needs to go to. And I'll do this until I get this sucker leveled out, okay? So this is how you can level out your cakes so that they're not so wonky or off to one side. This is what stops that, okay? How's that for cool? And that way I get it nice and smooth. Now, let's make sure that center is not higher than the edges, okay? We want it to be about the same as our edges. So let's try to get that there. I know that's kind of strange looking, isn't it? But look at the difference in the level between one that was just poured in and kind of smoothed out and one that I just did that to. Look at the difference between the two. It's stark and it's obvious, okay? And you're going to see the difference when they come out of the oven. They'll still be slightly domed, but they won't be to the left or right. They're going to be good, even cakes. And that makes your layer cake so much easier to layer, okay? Because you've got less to correct after the bake. Here's the thing. Layer cakes need to look flat. They need to look nice and even. And if... <clears throat> If your layer cake starts out at an angle, it'll be that way forever, okay? So you've got to just go through a few processes to try to get that resolved. Time for these to hit the oven. Oh yeah. Center rack, folks, right there, 350 degrees. This is normally taking around 20, 25 minutes. These have just come out of the oven. I've set my timer for 12 minutes. After 12 minutes, I'll flip them over and turn them out of this pan. Now to do that, simply put a plate or another one of these racks, what they call a pan rack or a cooling rack over the top of it, and then just hold the two together, flip it over, and that will come right out of that pan. Now, don't let these cool in the pan, all right? 
turn them out after 12 minutes. Don't wait for 20 minutes or they're going to start sticking again. Here's the problem. When you've cooked a cake, you know, of course it's got sugar in it. The sugar got really hot. It liquefied. Some of that sugar, which is on the outside of the cake, is trying to stick to the pan. Right now it's still too hot and soft and it can't do that. And if we will turn it out when it's early, then it'll release because of the uh, coating we put on it. But if we allow that sugar to solidify against the pan and harden, it won't come out quite as easy. Now, if you notice, these are coming, coming down a little bit and they're starting to flatten just the way we wanted them to do. And that was from the way we shaped them before putting them in the oven. These have had 12 minutes to cool. I'm going to invert them. Now, sometimes these things can be really hot. Depending on your cake pan, you might want to use a hot pad underneath it. Let me feel mine. I think I can get away with this. Just flip him over. There we go. Very gently lift that off. There we have it. Okay, number one is done. We got cake cooling. Oh, 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 oh yes, sir. Now, let's take care of doing number two right here there we go number two is going to stick a little you notice what I did just dropped him nothing else they're a little sticking on the edges and one one side and that is where simply put I didn't grease and flour it just well enough. And that's the difference it'll make. These little tears like this aren't going to make any difference in our finished product. We just don't want to let this cool and have a huge torn out section in the middle. That would affect our cake. Now look at this. I have two layers that are remarkably flat and level. They're beautiful looking. I want to go ahead and get them right side up again. I can do that. That's not a problem. Isn't that easy? There we go. And that's the advantage of having plenty of those little, what they call pan racks, hanging around. Lots of those will help you out. Now, up here is where we see the worst part of our cakes, and we got some unevenness here. Nothing major, nothing that buttercream won't cover, most of the time you end up having to take a knife and cut this. And I'll show you later how you do that anyway, in case yours domes or something like that. But as you can see, working the batter out, getting it smooth, and suddenly the cakes take on the right character and appearance. To make a buttercream. Buttercreams. Look, there's more than one kind of buttercream. You're going to hear all kinds of fancy names for buttercream. There's Italian buttercream. There's French buttercream, there's Swiss buttercream, there's German buttercream, oh yeah. I think there's even a Dutch buttercream, if I remember right. There's American buttercream. Uh, there's lots of different ways. Uh, for instance, you know, like the, the French buttercream um, is the favorite of a friend of mine. She's a pastry chef, does a beautiful job. Uh, she likes to make the French buttercream, and it's about making a simple syrup and making sure that syrup is at just the right temperature and when it is you beat it into egg yolks that you've already made frothy and light and slowly beat it in very gently drizzling it in and then as it comes up and it fluffs up nicely you then add and work in your softened butter and you have a french buttercream you know i see this the way i see ice cream here's the thing French ice cream has eggs in it. You have to cook it before you can chill it. American ice cream is just, nah, just take the cream, sweeten it, flavor it, and chill it down. There's your ice cream. Keep it simple. Sometimes the KISS method works, and sometimes it's really good. Let it come to room temperature. This, ooh, no, that's still a little bit cool. If it feels cool and it's firm, yeah. No, that ain't ready. That has to warm up a little more, and when it's room temperature and nice and soft, then it's ready to be creamed, not until. We're going to be working in our sugar. I need to take my sugar and sift it. This is important. 
sift your sugar. Get it done now. Have it already sifted. It's that simple. Take a pound of sugar, pour it into the sifter, sift it out, and boom, you have sifted sugar. You're ready. Have your extracts ready, whatever flavors you're deciding to go with. It doesn't take much to flavor a buttercream. It really carries flavor well. If you want colors, you can add colors to it. And that's what we're gonna do. I wanna show you how we make a buttercream a certain color. Now, I've only purchased primary colors to teach y'all with. And that was to teach you that you can make your own color by blending. And you can make it pastel or you can make it bold. It's up to you. And I wanna teach you how to use these, which are dry. This is a powdered form of food coloring. Wonderful stuff. Uh, and I tried it out the other day and was extremely pleased with it. I got a beautiful color from it. And um, well, in fact, hang on, let me show you. <clears throat> okay, this is some buttercream. I mixed up with this red right here. Bam, that's red, okay? Okay, that's some beautiful buttercream. And the thing of it is, is a buttercream can be made one day and it can still be just sitting there waiting for you to use it the next day, all right? This is the thing, it's, it's not like it's gonna spoil. Butter, number one, it doesn't spoil. You can leave butter sitting at room temperature for days and it doesn't hurt it. And that's because butter fat, is, is a preservative. The only thing in butter that'll spoil are the milk solids and they're being preserved by the butter fat. Okay, and so the next thing is, is it, we're putting sugar in it. Well, sugar is a preservative. You have a bowl full of preservative with some coloring and flavoring and some milk solids that are left in the butter. That's it. Don't worry about that. It won't spoil. Now, I'm just gonna wait. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Um, as soon as the butter is soft, we'll get on with making buttercream. By the way, you can speed this process by just cutting it up into small pieces and putting it in the bowl. It'll warm up quicker. I'm about to do that. That's what I'm talking about. Just cut it up. This way, it'll warm up in about half the time. All right, the butter is now soft. It has been coming up in temperature for a couple of hours now, and it is very, very soft. It's room temperature. Um, and if you can put your finger into it very easily, it just pushes right into it. That's where you want it to be. You don't want there to be any resistance in that butter. I'm going to be using one of my favorite ways, just like I did on the cake, just a simple half cup measuring cup to put my sugar in this. And it also kind of helps me to keep up with what I'm doing. Um, if you don't want your buttercream to be as sweet as what this produces, just back off of the sugar a little bit. And the easy way to know is, as you're adding sugar when you're about halfway in, taste it. If you need it more sweet, add more sugar. If not, and if you like the consistency of it, leave it the way it is. One thing's for sure though, when it comes to making buttercream more firm, the only way to do it is to add more sugar. The way we make it softer again, if we get too much sugar, is to add a little cream. But if you're good in your baking, you can avoid that altogether. An American buttercream is very simple if you keep it basic, okay? Butter, sugar, cream them, add some flavor, and that's that. I'm going to start by creaming this butter, and I want it to be light and fluffy and almost white in color. I want to double the bulk of the butter. All right, we're at three minutes, 45 seconds, and we are ending up, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. We got a beautiful butter product here, look at this. But I've got to do what I've done before, which is we got to scrape that bowl because there is butter that is unworked in here. I can see it. It's a different color. See the yellower? The quality of your buttercream begins, if it's an American buttercream, it begins with how well you do your creaming. If it's a, a, a Swiss buttercream, it's in how well you make the meringue, all right? And, and a French, it's in how, in, in how you get the 
sugar, uh, or I should say your simple syrup, mixed with your egg. It has to be done at the right temperature and the right way. So they all have their quirks. And if this one isn't done right, it's sort of boring. But if it's done well, it's a very, very good buttercream. All right, guys, this has been uh, six minutes, seven minutes right there. And that is including the time I spent scraping the bowl, okay? Now let me get that beater to the back. There we are. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, you see how we're getting little peaks on our butter? It's nice and pretty and soft and lovely. That's the way the butter should be right there. <laughs> Oh yeah. Now I see we got a beautiful butter product. We've doubled the bulk of what we had before. And now we're going to at low speed work in the sugar. Now, and I want to stop this. We're at 741, okay? And we're getting our sugar in there now. That didn't take that long, did it? Okay, and then we're going to cream it a little more in a minute when we get the sugar in there. But it's not going to be as long. This, take your sugar, the same way we did with our cake mix. There's no rush here. Just put it in one cup at a time. I should say uh, half a cup. And come up just one notch. Now be careful. If you're going too fast when you add something like this, it can create a dust cloud. All right, as I've told everyone in all of my videos since day one when it comes to what you're making take the time to stick a spoon in it and get just a little bit of it God, that is soft get a little bit of this and taste it you're looking not only for the flavor but you're looking for the texture the sweetness level all of that you're making a decision on whether you're going to add more sugar or if it's time to start adding in the flavors okay well, let's find out so just because we start with a certain amount of sugar when it comes to buttercream, it doesn't mean that that's what you are required to use. It just means that that was where the recipe began. You're the one that is in charge of how you make it, okay? Now, this only takes just a few seconds of us running it like this after I've added the final sugar. Right, it has got a wonderful texture going on. You can see from just the way something is hanging down here. <laughs> there we go. But the way this is, is acting, I've got a beautiful buttercream. What I want to do now is to get the right flavor in my buttercream. I've got a, a wonderful taste. It's nice and buttery. It's a sweet buttery flavor. But I want to introduce the coffee and I want to introduce that almond. And we're going to turn this into something completely different. So, again, on slow speed. This is where, to me, baking kind of gets fun, and it's almost like a chemistry experiment. You just get to allow yourself to kind of go with things. There's a little coffee. Now, I'm going to say this. Anytime you add any liquid at all, even in small amounts like this, it changes the texture and complexity of your buttercream. So I'm going to then have to test it again to see if it is the right texture. There's our almond. Oh yeah. And if I have the right texture now, that's going to be cool. I added a little extra sugar earlier, hoping to make up the difference. Now I'm looking at the shapes as the beater works it. You see how it is kind of pulling apart and making stringy lines and shapes. That's a very good sign. It shows that we have a buttercream that will at least hold some shape. Now, will it be pipeable? Will it hold shape after you pipe it? That's a whole different thing. But it will hold shape on the outside of a cake. Now, I would like to say that this has a texture to it that is very soft, very delicate. And that is, of course, just because we creamed it the right way. 
if you start with that creaming process the right right way really work the fat really work it well get it so that it's aerated properly then your buttercream is going to be what it should be soft wonderful delicate and delicious okay so you've never done a cake like this that's what i'm assuming and i saw so i'm going to give you the full one-on-one -on -one. Number one, when you're doing a cake and you're about to decorate it, a layer cake, you need something to move it around on. They sell a neat little thing like this. It's made for pizza and also for cakes. This is simply corrugated cardboard and one side is a white craft, like what we use for cooking. This is cooking paper here, okay? If you want, you can purchase these online from stores that sell uh, supplies for baking and for icing and, and decorating cakes and stuff like that. These are available. You just got to look for them. They're kind of hard to find, but I, I had to look around, but I did find some and I just bought a package of 25 of them. I went to, I went, pardon me, I went to a restaurant supply to purchase mine and it was easy to get them that way. So I've got this. <clears throat> I'm going to be putting a dollop of frosting in the middle of this to keep the cake from sliding around on this. However, how do we keep this from sliding around on that or anything else? Well, when I'm working it, I like to use just a little bit of tape on the edges. Another way would be to use a non-stick, or excuse me, a non-slip pad on this. You know, they make like that shelving material that's rubberized that keeps your plates and things from sliding around. That would work really well. I find that the tape seems to do it quite well for me. So I just do it that way. Now, something that I want to mention, when you are working with butter cakes and buttercream frosting, you're dealing with a lot of fat there, okay? A lot of butter fat. Well, butter fat has a tendency to soak into paper materials, all right? Like cardboard, like what we're about to use here. And because of that, you're going to want to do something to protect this if it matters to you. Now me, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care if it's a little bit grease stained from the butter because I'm gonna cover this up on the edges with fruit or something like that when I'm finished decorating out the cake. And that way it looks pretty. You can protect it in the interim with some strips of paper just like this. And this is just plain cooked paper. Let me tear this off. I could do a three-way liner like this. Put my dollop of buttercream in the middle, set my cake on there, and then when I'm finished working, whatever falls off the side of the cake or makes a mess, I simply pull these out from under the cake, and then I'm left with this nice and clean, all right? So that's how you can protect your cake from staining this. And by the way, that fat is gonna eventually go through this and still stain that. If you want, you can also purchase these that are lined with foil on top. They prevent that and they make some that are decorative. They're different colors. Some are gold, some silver. So take a look at what's available. I just like plain Jane and that's what I like working with. So we have this ready to go. I'm gonna put my cake up here before I get busy doing a whole lot with the cake, we want to talk about leveling them. Sometimes when you cook your cake, they don't come out level. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but you just showed us how to level them, and they came out pretty level. They did. They came out remarkably level. But you know what? They're not just totally perfect. Like it has a, it looks like a little bit of a low side there. It kind of pulled down in the middle. And so I would call this a low side. If I were to check this cake, what I would want to do is take my knife, lay it across it, and what I did earlier where I would turn my cake and then end up cutting through, I would do the same thing with my knife except I would just be doing this, okay, and going in a circle. And see how I have it kind of locked in place with that sawing motion, now see I've got some crumbs. I would end up with a nice flat top. Now I don't have to worry about that so much because what little variation I have can easily be filled in with, with buttercream. So when it's minor like this, hey, it's not a big problem. 
It's when you have a big old dome on it or something, you gotta run your knife around it. And what I just showed you doing it on a turntable or a Lazy Susan makes it really much, much easier. Do yourself a favor. If you can get something like that, do it. These aren't necessary. They simply make life a little easier. Now, so, all right, so there we go. We call that glue in the baking world. Okay, I wanna put this somewhere in the middle and I'm gonna kind of center it up. So I'm gonna move him around for a minute and I'm doing my finger guide here so I know where he's at. And what I'm doing is I'm bracing my arm against my body so it doesn't move and I can just get a good check on whether that's centered or not. And it really is, it's pretty, pretty much right in the center. Now, <clears throat> it's simple enough. We need to get a layer of buttercream on here, get our other layer on here, top it with buttercream, run buttercream around the sides, and then it needs to go in the refrigerator and set up. And the idea is it gives us a firm coat. That outer coat that we're about to put on, it's called a crumb coat. They call it a crumb coat because normally when you do a lot of cutting on these, you produce some of those crumbs like we produced just now. And that crumb gets caught up in the buttercream. And when you're finishing your buttercream on the outside of a cake, you don't want little crumbs stuck in it. So we do a crumb coat, we refrigerate it, and it prevents those loose crumbs from being up into our final coat of frosting. Let's get buttercream on here. Now here's the cool thing. A lot of your work when it comes to doing this kind of thing can be done with a regular spatula. So if you don't have the fancy tools, you don't actually have to have them right now. Look what I'm doing with a plain Jane everyday kitchen spatula. Now here's the thing, I want this inner layer to be fairly thick and I don't think I have enough buttercream to pull that off yet, but I'm about to. Let's see, I got them on the edge there. Now, if it goes over, if it kind of pushes out past that edge, that's not a problem. Don't lose any sleep over that. It's not going to affect anything because it's going to end up being a part of the whole cake anyway. All right? So don't let it worry you. So if you remember how we leveled the cake batter earlier, I propped this against my body and ran that in a circle. That's what I just did right then. But I've got thin spots on my edges. Okay, or that's empty. So it was a good and smart thing that our cake came out the way it did. And it came out the way it did because we spent a little extra time in the beginning trying to get it nice and flat and level and pretty and perfect so we could get that result right there. Okay, look at that. We've got us a nice, simple, two layer chocolate cake busting loose right there. We've seen the first part is just not that hard. We do now the crumb coat, and even though there's really no crumb on the outside of this, we still give it that thin layer because it's like a base coat that we work off of the top of, okay? So it's important, we need it on there. Our other icing is needing something to stick to, and this is what it's gonna be. But also, here's the thing. <laughs> and this is what I didn't tell you earlier. We're going to have this beautiful thin white coating of icing underneath the colored icing that we put over the top. So it gives it like a sandwich of two colors and it's really cool looking like that, okay? So we don't want it too thick, but we want enough on there to make a difference. All right, now, once I get it to this point, I'm gonna be needing to get icing on the sides of the cake. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna put a little icing there and just kind of bring it up, just like this. All right, and again, this does not have to be perfect. We're just getting it on there. Now, if you don't have this particular tool, use the back of a, a knife or a straight edge. If you have a bench scraper, that'll work perfect for this, okay? Anything like that'll work. 
And if you got a little corner like that, a little edge that's just not working with you, don't lose sleep over it, okay? There we have it. Our basic crumb coat's finished. Oops, I missed a part right there. As I was saying, our basic crumb coat is pretty much finished. I'm gonna do a little touch-up work on the edges and get it in the fridge. So here's the importance of that cardboard. Isn't that nice? Makes moving this thing around and handling it an absolute breeze. I have my cake in the refrigerator. It is cool on the outside of it now. I have a fresh batch of buttercream over here. Just made that. Now that is a little bit thicker than what we made last. Uh, this has more sugar in it uh, to the tune of, oh, almost half a pound of sugar more. So it's, it's a little bit stiffer. So now it's not quite two pounds. I'm at about a pound and a quarter right here of sugar to the one pound of um, butter. And that gives it a stiff enough consistency to hold its shape and it'll also pull into peaks and stay that way. Right here, coupler and the tip I'm going to use. So on the outside of the cake I'm going to do a little simple basket weave design. It is simple, it's easy to do and I recommend you try it if you've never done any icing. It'll give you a lot of confidence once you've done it. Now this right here is a basket weave tip. It's got the little jagged teeth on the tip there, see? And we want that basket weave tip to leave nice little lines like, like, uh, well, like a basket weave might look like. And uh, so that's what we're using this for. Now two ways we can use this with this bag. I could uh, cut the tip off of this bag, slide this through it, and it will work just fine just like that. Um, but you want to be careful when you cut. You want just the very, very tip of it to stick through. Um, and that's because you don't want the whole thing to stretch the bag out and cause a blowout where the tip just blows out of the bag. Uh, and that'll sometimes happen if you're, uh, what you're piping is a bit too firm. All right, so that's that. Now, and that's one of the nice things about these. They're a little less prone to come flying out. However, they're also big. Now, I've got a small bag here, and I wanted to show you, yeah, you can use these big things even on a small bag. I'm going to push it down in this bag nice and tight. I'm forcing it down in there. Okay, so it's tight right now. Right down here, okay? Underneath where that, see, here's my threads. They start up here, they end right here, and this is where that tip is. And I'm just going to make a simple, simple little mark right there. That's where I'm going to want to cut that sucker. And that's because I want the threads threaded onto um, my coupler, okay? Where I think, what am I, the threads. I want the bag threaded into the coupler threads. I can't speak today. I've been busy editing for several hours and uh, it kind of turns your brain to mush. Okay, so that's not perfect, but I think it'll work. There we go, let's see. All right, so as you can see, and it's kind of hard to see, here's my mark. I cut just underneath it so you could see that it's right at the bottom of the threads. Over here, it's just, the thread is just slightly showing and that's not a problem. All right, so we can take our tip, put it in the other, in the cap right there very gently thread these two together. You want to make sure they're firm. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, this is ready to go. Now here's the thing. Beautiful thing about this. Let's say I want to switch from this tip to a different kind of tip, maybe even a little larger. Not a problem. I've got a coupler on here that handles two different sizes of tips and uh, it handles some of the larger more robust tips that can do some big work. All right, so there you have it. Um, this is a big cake decorating type tip, not so much for like cupcakes or anything like that. Now on the outside of a basket weave, I think personally, I think that uh, it should be kind of a brown color. So let's see here, do I want red or green first? I guess it doesn't matter, does it? I'm gonna wash my spatula in between uses 
There we go. Now, see what I have there? And that's really not a measurement. It's not even enough to weigh. It's, you know, a portion of a gram, I would say, maybe a quarter of a gram to a half. I'm guessing here only by the quantity that I've removed from the jar. All right, I need to clean this so I don't corrupt my red. There we go. And that's something that's important. Don't just go dipping right into the next thing because it, it will. It will affect, one thing will affect another when it comes to recipes like this. Okay, a similar amount of red. Got my beautiful buttercream here and a nice spatula. Let's take that spatula and work this stuff in. Now, at first it'll seem a little wonky, but it will become the right color. Isn't that wild? How quick we see a change in that. Hmm? Now I can see that red is really fighting. That is a strong, strong dye, and it, and it is dominant right now. So I'm probably going to have to add some more green to get what I'm looking for on the outside of this, because this is it's sort of a, like a muted red. And I think I have a nice color to work across the outside of my cake. Isn't that cool? All right, so this shows you, and I did this on purpose. When I purchased these colors, I bought four colors. These are 12 gram bottles. They're somewhat expensive. And um, I didn't want to break the bank, but at the same time, I wanted to show folks that that's all you need. Get the primaries, bright red, bright blue, bright yellow, bright or bold green, and boom, you have got what you need to make any color you want. And if you're not sure what color uh, or what to do to get the color you want, <laughs> ask Google. Google will tell you the proportions and everything you need to use, what colors to mix together. Alrighty, I have here a bag that we loaded earlier. Now this is a, a bag that's made for common um, commercial we're not commercial, but, but home use. And uh, so it's sold all over the United States and it's a common brand name. They give you a fill line here. Now they're serious about this, folks. The fill line is important. Your, your hand is gonna be in contact with the buttercream and it's gonna start heating it up. And too much buttercream means, well, a rather soft condition by the time you're a quarter or a third of the way through your cake. So, <laughs> it's really cool to go ahead and either fill more than one of these or go ahead and use a small amount and refill frequently. Doing this, there is one thing I'd like to say. Everybody tells you the same thing. Fold this backward, all right? And they're right, okay? They're not lying to you. But here's the thing they're not saying. When folding it backward, don't fold it a little bit. Fold it a whole lot. Okay. The idea here is you don't want to overfill, and the second thing is you don't want a whole lot of frosting all over this part of your piping bag, because then you're going to get it all over you and your hands and everything else when it comes time to um, refill it. Okay, so you got to think about the refill thing. So anyway, after you get it un or folded backwards, you can kind of straighten it out a little bit and pull open, just like this. That way it'll kind of shape that opening a little bit. You can use a water glass if you like. Get down there, that. there we go. And that helps you to fill that thing up. It just kind of holds it open for you. It makes life a whole lot easier, so go ahead and do that. Um, here we go, I'm gonna get some of this in there, and then I wanna get on with having a little bit of fun. I really enjoy piping. I really enjoy doing this kind of stuff. It to me is, um, it's, it's a creative push that's really, really fun. Okay, now that you got the thing filled, what do we do next? Okay, well, what do you do to get out of the glass? Okay, just reach underneath here, grab this nozzle, just like this, and grab that tip, pull them up in a circle, just like so. Isn't that cool? 
Now, I'll say this about these turntables. They're not necessary. They're nice, okay? They really are. And uh, it makes working a cake a lot easier. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. This one, um, I, think, I think it was around 25 bucks I spent for this. It wasn't much. Um, and don't spend much. Now, this is this hard, all right? So our buttercream is firmed up really nice. And even though it's uneven, that I'm gonna, that's not gonna matter. Don't worry about that at all because what you're about to put over it is gonna completely cover all of that. Basket weave works like this, and this is something that the other folks don't seem to mention, okay? When you're gonna do a basket weave, I fold my bag over a little bit here. You do yours however you want. I just kind of fold it a couple of times, pinch it with my little finger and twist. And here's the thing. Keep the bowl that you put it in there from to push it back out. And that's called what we call burping it. It just makes sure that there's no air up in that tip or anything. And there we have it. Now, when you're going to do one of these basket weaves, the tip is only jagged on one edge, on one side. So you're going to have to face that away from the direction you're moving. So the smooth side is in the direction I'm moving. So if I'm coming from bottom up, the smooth side is face up. If I'm moving from the top down, the smooth side is face down and the jagged side is up like this, okay? That's the way that works. Now, the next thing, if you're gonna do basket weave, remember the width of this tip is how wide you want to separate your lines. You're gonna do a grouping of vertical lines and then we're gonna do some cross lines, okay? And remember, your cake is nice and firm. So it's not gonna be an issue if we mess up. We just scrape it off and redo it. Isn't that simple? I said it doesn't have to be perfect. Perfection is not a part of this game. It's just have fun. That's a part of the game right there. If you're having a good time, then it'll come out all right. I can say this, attitude reflects in cooking. You can see attitude, good or bad, all right? I'm gonna say this. I wanna do something real quick. Turntables are great, as I mentioned, but sometimes they're also a major pain in the rear. And when you're moving sideways and you don't want the cake to move, it can be a real aggravating situation. So I'm gonna put a little piece of tape on there just to keep that firm so it won't move on me. And then remember, here's the jagged side. I need to move away from that. I wanna come over the top here. All right, just that simple. I wanna skip one. Come over the top here, done. Now on the one that I skipped, come up, come over him, boom, just like that. And then we're gonna do it again, right here, right here. And that's how you do your basket weave. How cool is that, right? Okay, and then of course you're gonna do one right above those. And if these vertical lines are too soft for you to work around, remember, put it in the fridge, firm them up, and do your cross lines, okay? Do all of your verticals first, and then do your crosses if you want. I'm take my tape off of my bottom there so I can turn it again. My buttercream is a bit soft, okay? There's a couple of things I can do to firm it. One, add more sugar. Two, cool it down, refrigerate it just a little bit. All right, we have the basket we finished up. Don't worry about the little patches of white. Guys, let me tell you, that kind of sets it off. It gives it a real three-dimensional flare and it makes it look sharp, okay? So it's cool. That's one of the things that's really helping that to pop. Now, I'm gonna put this in the fridge. I'm gonna cool it back down again. And when I'm done, we're gonna do another decoration on the top, and that's gonna be a series of flowers, okay? Sometimes in life, we decide for whatever reason, we don't need to use the coupler, or let's say the coupler breaks, we don't have the coupler, what have you. Okay, so here goes the coupler, it's gonna go away. So I'm gonna use my tip without a coupler, and I'm gonna use one of these market 
commonly available bags, very, very common. And I want to push this tip down in there just as far as I can get it, get it nice and tight. Okay, it looks like it's right there at the end of the little triangle where they, I can get my pin to mark, there we go. <clears throat> I'll push this back out. There it goes. Now what I'm wanting after I trim this is for that tip to just barely stick through. I don't want much of the uh, the whole thing coming through the end of the bag. So we're going to do this right here. Now let's see if that tip works better this time. Get it down in there. Not the end. Well, looky there. That tip is just barely protruding past the plastic. Barely. And that's what I want right there. So I've got both of my tips ready to pipe. All right, I'm going to do the exact same thing I did just the other day, mixing up color. I'm going to mix up one batch of red, one batch of yellow, and a small batch of green. Those little leaves aren't going to take up quite as much as the big flowers that I'm going to put on top. My colors are all mixed up and ready to go in the piping bags. I'm going to be using the green in my uh, canvas bag since I've already got the right tip on it. And the other two bags have my Russian tips. I'll be using the red and yellow in those. I'm not going to bother with the green right now. I'm going to do my red and yellow flowers, as many as of them, uh, excuse me, as many of them as I can get on there before I start having problems, and then get it right back into the refrigerator to firm up. Every time you put it in the fridge, it makes this stuff hard, and it's easier to work other things around it. So when I go piping in leaves around these, it's less likely to bump them and cause problems. I've just pulled my cake out of the refrigerator and again, nice and hard. Uh, that's the neat thing about this. And if you know, we had such soft buttercream on the edge on this brown and I wouldn't be able to touch it like this earlier. And back at room temperature, once it warms up and it gets soft again, I won't be able to then. But now with it cold, it's workable. So remember, refrigeration is your friend when it comes to working something like that now. Okay, squeeze and pull straight up, then release and keep gently pulling. Okay, so this was what in a while if they want to be problematic just give them a little coaxing okay now I want to move over the amount of space that a red one might fit I'll drop another yellow we'll do another yellow right here I'm gonna squeeze a red one right in between them where it's too narrow Okay, first red one here. Come on, let go. Okay, that one is bad, so we're going to remove him. And occasionally, if something like that happens, it happens. Don't lose sleep over it, okay? Simply remember that sometimes things go awry. It's a little less than perfect, and it's fixable. If you notice, I try not to be too distinct in how I'm doing this, just as if 
I was packing flowers into a basket. Well, there we have it. We have us a basket full of flowers. It's kind of incomplete though. We need some leaves. You have seen me using the other uh, bags, those plastic bags, and they're pretty cool. I'll be honest with you, frankly, my preferred bags when I'm doing piping are these canvas bags. And I'm using a, a lined canvas bag, so this has a, a waterproof liner on it. And, uh, and they really do hold up well. Now I've turned it inside out, as you can see here, and uh, that's the best way to fill any of these things. You've seen a lot of people, they'll put them in a glass to fill them. But here's the thing, when I'm filling one of these, I usually take, you know, some of my... I'll take some of my frosting and put it deep in here and then I'll rub it off on the side against my hand. Okay, because my hand is pressing against that bag. So I can wipe it off in there basically and then get more and do that again. So my hand is actually doing more than just holding the bag. It's assisting the work and it really makes this quite easy. And so that's exactly what I do is I just go in there, wipe it off. And I used my thumb right then. Did my thumb again. And I want to fill this thing, okay? So it's not like I want to use a little of this. I plan to put all of this in there. And what I don't use, I will simply push out. All right? Okay. I think I have enough for my leaves. And that's exactly what I do to fill my piping bag. And then I just, I grab down here where the tip is and pull up with my hand. And that will invert that, okay? Come up with them, attach it to the base by piping some out, come up, gently relieving that. There, there is a leaf coming right off. And doesn't that look just like a leaf? And the idea there is as you're coming up, you have to gently ease off of the pressure of that bag. And then, boom, it gives you your cute little leaf. Now we're gonna do another one. We're gonna come right here. I wanna squeeze some out so we stuck to the base. Bring him up, gently easing off. And there we go, another leaf. Those little, sh uh, if you shake a little bit, that doesn't hurt. It makes it look real, okay? It's, Mother Nature is not, uh, doesn't have a lot of symmetry in it. It has a lot of randomness. And, and if, you, if you play on that random, randomness, you're you're working with it, okay? That's it's a good thing. Don't don't worry about that. Also, I would like leaves coming out of some of my basket weave. So I'm going to do exactly that. There we go. Leaves sticking right out from in between the layers of the basket weave. And isn't that cool? Remember those little gaps that we had before? Well, guess what? Those little gaps are now just something special for us to play with. <laughs> so, I guess that's, uh, what do we call it? Chocolate cake? That's a neat name for it. Chocolate cake. Ta-da! Now, yeah, it's all about presentation, isn't it? The quantity of everything we use today, let's start with that butter back there. That was 165 grams of butter. Hold it, in case you're wondering, why am I giving measurements like that? Look, I decided if I want to teach baking, you need to start doing things by measurement, and this is the way to do it. 165 grams of butter, if you do things by weight, much more accurate results and your cakes are the same every time. So, we got 165 grams of butter, and to that, on that flour, 270 grams of flour. Right here, 325 grams of sugar. One cup of milk and two eggs. Now that gives you your basic cake ingredients right there. We need some leavening, and for that, one teaspoon of each, baking soda and baking powder. On the salt, one quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Now on the weight measurements here, that's four grams of soda, two grams of baking powder. The cinnamon was too light to measure. It is a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. 
And on that cocoa, that's 25 grams of cocoa and one teaspoon of vanilla. The flavors that we get from a cake that's done like this are incredible. This gives a beautiful sponge texture and, well, makes a good cake. So let's take a look at that thing. Here we are at the end of the day. I'm ready to cut the cake. Oh yeah. So what I'm gonna do is just, I guess, find a center point and just kind of go straight down on him. Now, right now, this cake is somewhat firm because it has been in the fridge for some time. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is clean my knife and we're gonna make another cut. Well, folks, it looks like all things came out fairly decent. I can't complain. Got a cute little cake. It's been a long day of cooking. And it yielded a most magnificent slice of cake. Beautiful. Delicious. The detail on it detail is all there. Every bit of it. The flowers themselves, see inside of them there? Uh huh? Those layers, gorgeous. Folks, that's cake 101 for you right there. Uh, we're gonna have some other cake recipes this season too, <laughs> okay? Anyway, let's, uh, and I have this still a little bit chilled, and I kind of want it that way. Mm. Oh, man. Okay. Something I noticed early on when I made this buttercream, it had this magnificent flavor of almost like caramel when you combine almond and coffee together they work on each other in a weird way and they give this caramel like flavor and it's really cool it's good and it works great with a chocolate cake that tiny bit of cinnamon in the background just setting everything off making you wonder what's really going on in there that Ooh, I'm going to enjoy my cake tonight. <laughs> That's a good cake, folks. Please enjoy your cake. Thank you very much for watching this. If you have comments, you know where to put them. If you would, please, a thumbs up is always appreciated. If you haven't subscribed, you're crazy. I've got hundreds of recipes. Go ahead and subscribe and click that bell so you know when I'm putting out new recipes, which, by the way, it's Thursday mornings, almost always. Okay, so cake more to come season six is here ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for watching if you would please take a look at my channel there's a lot of stuff there in the description box there's some links take a look at what those links take you to there is a recipe there also and my website thank you very much and folks have a good day Ooh, cake Hot dog <laughs>